My name is Jan Raskus, and I'm a Senior Policy Advisor in the Planning and Policy Division, Civil Works. I am directly involved in the implementation of WERDA 2014. As most of you may know, President Obama signed the Water Resources Reform and Development Act of 2014 into law on June 10, 2014. WERDA is the primary legisla legislation by which the Congress authorizes the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers' key civil works missions, including navigation, flood risk management, and environmental restoration. It is important to note that this is an authorization bill, not an appropriations bill. The Corps is currently developing implementation guidance for the provisions listed in Order 2014 in coordination with the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, which will provide the policies and procedures to be used in implementing the new law. As part of this development, we have scheduled four listening sessions to hear from our stakeholders and the public regarding your comments, concerns, and issues related to the implementation of Order 2014. We will take your comments into consideration as we prepare this implementation guidance. Each of the listening sessions covers a different collection of the more important general program and policy provisions of WORDA. <coughs> These policy provisions <coughs> have been categorized into general theme areas so that the listening sessions can concentrate on two or more important theme areas or categories. Uh, the first three listening sessions that we had covered uh, the following topics. We've covered deauthorization and backlog prevention, uh, project development and delivery, including planning, alternative financing, which includes contributed funds and crediting, and public-private partnerships. That We did that in our second session. And in the third session, we covered levy safety, dam safety, and the regulatory provisions that cover uh, the 404 program and the Section 408 uh, authority. Today's session uh, will cover non-federal implementation, uh, water supply and reservoirs, and navigation. And you should, if you, for those of you who are on the webinar, you should be able to see the specific provisions that we are taking comments on today. If you have a comment that does not fall into one of these theme areas, you may email it to uh, us at wrrda at usace.army.mil, along with comments on any of the word of provisions. As I mentioned, today's listening session will focus on several key word of provisions that relate to the non-federal study and implementation of core projects, water supply and reservoir operations, and navigation, including inland navigation as well as the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. Today's session will be recorded and transcribed, and these files will be made available on the Corps' WERDA website. The transcripts from the three previous listening sessions have been al already have been posted on the website as well as the actual recordings of the listening sessions. On behalf of the Army Corps of Engineers, we welcome your commentary and look forward to hearing from you. I will now turn it over to Jean Pollock with the Corps' Public Affairs Office to review the ground rules for today's session. All right. Thank you, Jan. And this is Gene Pollock with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers Public Affairs Office. And before I go into the, uh, the ground rules, uh, Eddie, at this time, if you would like to give instructions uh, to callers on how they can uh, uh, begin to queue up uh, to raise their comments. Absolutely. So for all of our participants here, if you would like to make a comment, you may dial star 1 on your phone or use the raise hand icon if you are joining using the AT&T Connect participant application. You will be notified once your line is unmuted, at which point you may proceed to state your name and your comment again. If you would like to join the queue to make a comment, you may dial star 1 on your phone or use the raise hand icon. You will be notified once your line is unmuted, at which point you may immediately proceed to state your name and your comment. All right. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, for those who may be in a uh, phone-only mode and do not have access to the webinar, uh, the slides that we have today are, are fairly general. Uh, they are available online on the website, uh, the Word of website that Jan mentioned earlier. 
Um, would like to remind everybody that when you uh, make comments, uh, please be sure to include your name and the organization that you represent. Uh, we have a limit of three minutes uh, to provide the comments. Uh, as you approach your three-minute time, uh, I will um, come in about 30 seconds or so before the end of your time limit to remind you that uh, you're approaching the, the, the time limit. Uh, if you have follow-on comments or more than one comment to make uh, and you've reached your time limit, uh, you can re-enter the queue uh, and, uh, and again uh, uh, raise those comments. Uh, key to this is this is a listening session. It's intended for us to be able to uh, hear your thoughts and ideas about implementation of the, uh, the Word of Guidance. Uh, it will not be a back and forth discussion or a question and answer session. Uh, if you make a, a point or raise a comment that we need some clarification on, perhaps uh, we may uh, interrupt to, uh, to ask for a clarification on uh, key to this as well for helping us to keep track of all these comments is to please let us know specifically which provision you're addressing. Um, and then uh, again to remind everybody uh, the, the session is being recorded and transcribed and uh, the comments and, uh, with all the information that you raise will be available on the website uh, once, we, uh, once we're available to put it online. And having said that, I believe uh, Eddie, we are ready to start taking comments. That sounds good. So let me take over the queue here and let me start unmuting lines. Greg, you may go ahead. Cool. Greg, you may speak. Greg? Yes, that's correct. You're on. Please go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity uh, to hold these uh, in the input on, on the word. Uh, um, my name is Greg Thomas. I'm the general manager for Rincon Water out of Escondido, California. I'm uh, one of 11 member agencies uh, as part of the North San Diego Water Reuse Coalition, a uh, partnership of agencies related to uh, water reuse and uh, becoming more independent uh, from imported water sources from the north, northern California, uh, Colorado, and it's also with groundwater. So as you know, there's a serious drought here in California West and in the West Coast. And um, so this word uh, is uh, very important to us. Uh, my comments uh, or input, again, is uh, on Section 1014, um, consideration of uh, repealing the reconnaissance study that's uh, part of the, uh, the uh, act. Um, we understand it was repealed in Section 1002, and uh, if the Army Corps of Engineers still chooses to conduct a preliminary study for 1014, uh, we recommend using a project management plan that can, that can be completed at the early stages of the feasibility study. Um, uh, we're used as, uh, as uh, water agencies and sewer agencies, very used to doing our own feasibility studies and looking at project management uh, when we execute uh, projects, especially large scale. So uh, we're hoping that um, we can get rid of the preliminary study um, that's in the, uh, in the act or, uh, or use a uh, more streamlined version. Um, it's also recommended that uh, the process of formulating a feasibility study, again, be streamlined and more user friendly if, if one is going to be used. Um, uh, and again, appropriate for type of projects we're going to be doing as a non-federal interest. Um, and then last, uh, my comment is, uh, or item for input is uh, that we urge the Army Corps of Engineers to issue guidelines for Section 1014 as soon as possible. Um, you know, failure to act expeditiously, it, it, given that uh, there's a lot of critical infrastructure we're looking at, especially in, uh, in, in to uh, battle the effects of the climate change and drought conditions uh, facing our communities out here. We have a very sizable project we're looking at, and we really could use the uh, word uh, execution here shortly um, in getting through that process. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Greg. Uh, next, Eddie. David, please go ahead. Thank you. My name is David Taylor. I'm the manager for Warwick Lake Master Conservancy District, 
And I'm also a member of the Fair Water Users Coalition, a coalition of utilities, wholesale water providers, and other entities who have M&I water supply agreements with the Corps or who otherwise rely on water from USACE facilities. There are coalition, coalition members in 10 states across the country. We're going to be speaking about Section 1046B today. One of the key issues that brought our group together was rapidly rising O&M costs that many M&I contract holders were experiencing. In recent years, it is not uncommon for an entity contracting for water supply to receive a substantially higher O&M bill from the USACE months after the conclusion of the year-long O&M billing period with little or no explanation what projects were done, <clears throat> what they cost, and why were they were considered joint use and thus chargeable to the M&I contract holders. Our coalition is working to ensure that the cost of raw water is both fair and predictable, and these large O&M increases that are unplanned and not budgeted for place considerable economic strain on many water suppliers who often have to pass these costs on to the communities they serve. Section 1046B is the result of our members telling our respective congressional delegations about our experiences with this issue. We know the Corps has worked with our supporters in Congress and appreciate the progress that this section represents. Knowing in advance for a period of five years what projects the Corps is planning to carry out each, in each facility and what the estimated cost will be will certainly go a long way to help all who rely on USAC water supply to plan and budget for future O&M costs. Our group would respectfully make the following suggestions to the USACE for further to consider as it implements Section 1046B. Number one, start providing the estimates as soon as possible. We're assuming these will be provided for fiscal year 2015 and calendar year 2015, depending upon the billing cycle for each entity. Provide, excuse me, number two, provide M&I contract holders notice when it is clear that an estimate is off target. If, during the course of a year, it's clear that the USAC will be spending considerably more, say, 10% than what's provided in the estimate, prompt notice would help contract holders to make an adjustment to their budget and take steps to deal with the increased cost that was not budgeted. Number three, Provide M&I contract holders with mid-year status report of ongoing O&M costs and expected costs. And four, provide M&I contract holders with a uniform bill format, which includes detailed explanation on the basis of what's being charged in, in, at the conclusion of each year. We found that, that what information provided on our O&M bills varies Thirty seconds remaining. four districts, and some receive a bill with a good deal of explanation, and others do not. We believe that... Thank you. We, believe, we believe these items could be carried out as part of the implementation of the section without, without placing any undue expense or hardship. We look forward to continuing to work with USAEC. Uh, David, thank these you for those comments. Related to water supply. Uh, next, Eddie. Thank you. All right. For the next comment, let's see here. Naomi, please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Naomi Sabino. I'm with the Levenheim Municipal Water District, also part of the North San Diego Water Reuse Coalition, the 11-member coalition mentioned by Greg Thomas. I'm commenting on provision section uh, 1014, and it has to do with the preliminary environmental effort or the CEQA utilization. It is recommended that the Army Corps of Engineers consider a preliminary environmental analysis document which contains material that would assist the Army Corps in determining whether a project is deemed eligible for authorization. This preliminary environmental analysis document would provide the initial environmental ev evaluation of a project before it is authorized, and it would not require NEPA compliance during the review of a feasibility study report. It is also recommended that the Army Corps consider using non-federal environmental review processes such as the CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, as a basis for preparing NEPA documents, either incorporated by reference or, in certain cases, adopted as environmental assessments. Upon completion of this review, the federal agency may issue a FONSI, findings of no significant impact. This could save significant time at the federal level 
as the process does not need to be replicated at the federal level each time, what has already been undertaken at the local agency would stand. Furthermore, Section 1014 would, should state that a feasibility study is not complete for purposes of appropriations until NEPA and other environmental requirements are met. Thank you very much. All right, Naomi, thank you for those comments. Uh, next, Eddie. All right, we will go to the next call. Just a quick note for the folks who are only dialed in and not uh, joining using the computer, you will hear an automated message telling you that your line is muted. You may immediately proceed to state your name, your organization, and your comment. Hi, this is Deborah Colbert with Waterways Council. I want to thank you all again for this stakeholder opportunity. It's, it's very much appreciated. Uh, my comment pertains to navigation, and as I said on one of the earlier calls that were, were uh, related to deauthorization, of the current list of priority projects under the Capital Development Plan, none should be considered or included for deauthorization. Thank you. All right, Deb, thank you. And uh, Eddie, next. Hello, this is Don Duval, a uh, corn, elk, corn grower from Southern Illinois. And uh, I would uh, like to comment under the na navigation uh, aspect and uh, second Debbie's previous comment and remind the Corps that navigation should be the number one priority. Uh, and I wanted to comment that we are currently harvesting a record corn crop right now in Illinois and it's in the United States. And we need to find a home for this huge crop. And exports will play a major part in that. So we need to not only maintain our current water infrastructure, but expand it, especially in light of the Panama Canal expansion. Otherwise, the locks and dam systems that we now have will become an even greater bottleneck in that export process. And again, I thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, Don, thank you. Uh, next, Eddie. Kevin, you may go ahead. This is Kevin Run with Illinois Farm Bureau. Illinois agriculture, of course, has a very strong interest in our inland waterway transportation system. And uh, not only maintaining, but also improving that system is really important when we look particularly at our ability to compete in world markets here with agricultural goods. In the navigation section, there's a new cost share formula established in Section 206 of WERDA regarding the completion of the Olmstead Lock and Dam. Now, that will free up some funds for other important inland waterway projects, but to make it work, Congress has to appropriate, and of course the administration has to spend at the highest funding levels from the trust fund that can be supported by diesel tax revenues paid by the industry. And we're asking that the administration make that recommendation to Congress and then follow through on that spending plan. And of course, to make that most impactful, there needs to be anywhere from a six to a nine cent increase in that current barge diesel fuel user fee. And we support that, as do most of the other industry stakeholders here in inland waterway navigation. So it's essential to accommodate the needed inland waterway modernization that it's already been authorized by Congress. So the Corps of the Engineers and the administration are asked to support enactment of that change. And I uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Kevin, thank you for those comments. Next, Eddie. David, please go ahead. Hi, this is David Manns, and I'm with the Southwest Arkansas Water District. We are commenting on Section 1046D, as in Delta. Congress passed the 1946 or passed Section 1046 with the goal of providing the Corps with flexibility so that the agency has the appropriate tools to deal with unique and special circumstances. As you know, there are a few situations out there where water supply planning was done many, many decades ago that projected growth that just never materialized. Consequently, the 
contracts in these isolated instances are based on assumptions that are that are wildly optimistic. Southwest Arkansas Water District recommends that Section 1046B be viewed in the spirit of the 1946 Water Supply Act with the goal of developing guidance that allows for robust flexibility for the secretary so that she can deal with unique special circumstances in a fair and equitable manner. We feel two overarching guiding principles would be beneficial. The first is to review the historical record in the context of projected development versus actual development. In cases where it seems logical that hypergrowth is unlikely to appear, and this would be in cases where the projected growth never materialized, the Corps may consider this an important data point. In other words, does there appear to be a regional need for the future use of water storage that, was, that has somehow been overlooked? The other is to consider the financial capabilities of the non-federal sponsor. Now, obviously, things would have been much different had the projected growth materialized. However, in these isolated circumstances where it did not, the financial capability for a non-federal sponsor would seem an important and appropriate data point to consider in the spirit of being fair and equitable under the 1946 Water Supply Act. So thank you for uh, taking our comments and be happy to answer the questions if you have them. All right, David, thank you for your comments. Uh, Eddie, next caller. Yes, I'm David Evans and I'm with uh, American Commercial Lines and I would like to address Section 4002D of WERDA, which deals specifically with flexibility and maintaining channel on the Mississippi River during extremely low water conditions. Uh, paragraph 2 of 4002 directs the Corps in consultation with the Coast Guard to develop a report identifying areas that are unsafe and unreliable for commercial navigation during those extreme low water conditions using data from most extreme low water events. The report is to be used to identify locations for potential modifications, also including improvements outside the authorized Mississippi River Federal Navigation Channel that will alleviate hazards in those areas that constrain navigation during those extreme low water events along the Federal Channel. Paragraph 3 authorizes the Corps in consultation with the Coast Guard to carry out activities outside the authorized Mississippi River Federal Navigation Channel, including the construction and operation and maintenance of fleeting areas that are necessary for safe and reliable navigation in the Federal Channel and have been identified in the report. Uh, paragraph 4 limits the Corps' authority to carry out the activities authorized by the paragraph 3 only for such periods to maintain navigation during the extreme low water conditions or events. Uh, ACL operates a barge loading facility in the St. Louis area that's located on the right descending bank of the Mississippi River between miles 184 and 185. Our facility uh, has handled over 7 million tons of barge cargo in a typical year. During the 2013 extreme and prolonged low water event, the ability to transit uh, materials from our facility as well as industry was impacted by that uh, low water event. Uh, several weeks and several occasions the impact developed weeks before any navigation impact occurred in the Federal Channel. The main cause, cause of the impact, of course, was low water and the buildup of, of silt in the Mississippi River Channel up above the Federal Channel. Once the silt continued to build downstream and into the Federal Channel, dredging operations were started and impact to industry were eased as the silt continued to dissipate. The problem continued as the silt above the Federal Channel continued to work down and on several occasions rejet dredging was required until all the silt that was located above the federal channel had been scoured out. We believe if attention had been placed on the silting occurrence up above the federal channel, impact to other industry and our industry could have minimized and multiple dredging operations could have greatly been reduced. Uh, ACL believes that the area of the Mississippi River between our St. Louis facility and the federal channel meets the requirements described in section 402D subsection 2 and requests that the Corps include this location in the report as required by the section 
and I would like to offer my sincere appreciation for allowing us to participate in this session. All right. David, thank you for the comments. Uh, next, Eddie. This is Mike Tui with the Waterways Council. The Waterways Council. And we appreciate uh, appreciate very much the opportunity to uh, participate in this, as others have stated. And we will file a comprehensive uh, statement uh, for the record. Uh, <clears throat> subsection D of WERDA 2002 is uh, what I'd like to comment on. This section, among other things, requires the Secretary of the Army to develop, in coordination with the Inland Waterway User Board, a new 20-year capital investment program from the Inland and intracoastal waterways, taking into consideration the capital development plan and ensuring that investments are made efficiently and in a geographically dispersed manner. As the cost-sharing partners for this 20-year plan, navigation stakeholders should be given full opportunity to participate in the development of this plan. Also, for purposes of making decisions about including the BioSorel project among these recommended priority construction funding in the new 20-year capital investment program, the Corps should immediately review the BioSorel project's economic justification and update that justification to reflect the significant new energy-related traffic being experienced or expected to be experienced through the lock because of the new trends related to advances in production technologies and international trade policies. We would also like to note that the Corps should produce an analysis of the impact of the closure of the Upper St. Anthony Falls Lock using Word of 2007 as a precedent should address and include a recommendation for compensation for shippers and carriers adversely impacted by that closure. We would also note that the hour of services reduction proposed by the Corps is premature for Locks uh, 1 and the Lower St. Anthony and should not occur until the closure of the Upper St. Anthony Fall Lock occurs. Uh, finally, uh, <clears throat> WCI is supportive of the concept of public-private partnerships, but feel that the economic analysis of how this would work for barge shipping is needed. The industry, along with members of Congress, remain strongly opposed to lockage fees in any form. And uh, finally, I would just say that the revised definition of major rehabilitation under WERDA, along with other policy changes that include core reform, should be implemented as soon as possible. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. All right, Mike, thank you for those comments. Uh, next caller, Eddie. Chris, you may go ahead. Hi, uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Chris Smith. I'm with the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, AASHTO, with the 52 State Departments of Transportation. Uh, just some general comments on sections 1014, 1016, and 1043. Uh, state DOTs are, are generally. Um, uh, pleased with the with Congress's work on the Water Resources Reform and Development Act in this regard, uh, looking for streamlining efforts in the uh, Corps' um, navigation um, program process as it deals with feasibility studies. Often state DOTs are those non-federal sponsors of feasibility studies, and through some uh, prior bureaucratic issues and processes have had uh, feasibility studies not go as far as they needed to do. So we're encouraged by Congress's action, look forward to working with the Corps of Engineers on an implementation process that uh, brings this legislation to the fore and, and, and allows states to do, um, and, and even within the pilot program, uh, take control of some of these feasibility studies themselves. Um, as was mentioned earlier by other commenters, we'll provide formal comments in more detail on some of these uh, issues both uh, in advance and as they come out through the rulemaking and uh, general guidance process. Thank you again for letting us comment today. All right, thank you, Chris. Next, Eddie. Hello, good day. My name is Stan Bourne. I'm uh, a farmer and soybean grower and uh, director on the Illinois Soybean Association. 
I'm also a member of the American Soybean Association. First, I'd like to thank the Corps for uh, setting this up and uh, always being willing to listen. Uh, my comments are related to uh, the navigation session, section, and my primary uh, concern is making sure that the uh, competitive advantage that we enjoy in our grain export markets, thanks to the great logistics that uh, we have here in the Midwest, uh, is maintained. Uh, the infrastructure uh, that we have on the Mississippi River helps Illinois uh, soybean farmers effectively compete for export business. And it's really important because about half of every, every, every row in uh, soybeans is exported. And in fact, uh, in Illinois, uh, every fourth row is uh, bound for China. So it's, it's really important that we have this infrastructure uh, to allow us to uh, compete effectively, particularly South American uh, growers. We need to uh, ensure effective maintenance of our locks and dams uh, to uh, have unimpeded flow of uh, our commodity grains so that Illinois farmers uh, can compete effectively uh, for this export business and uh, contribute to uh, jobs and uh, health and welfare in, uh, in the state of Illinois. Uh, thanks a lot for your opportunities to uh, allow us to comment. Have a great day. All right, Stan, thank you for those comments. Uh, next, Eddie. Dawn, you may go ahead. Great, thank you. This is Dawn Sheriff of the Everglades Foundation. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, provide some feedback on the guidelines. Um, you know, the Section 1014 provision uh, sets out a process for non federal interests to um, go ahead and get construction projects permitted before they're authorized. Um, and so we want to make sure that, that this is a high priority for getting um, this guidance out quickly as it uh, particularly pertains to things that, that require um, kind of fast moving. So we would like this section to be prioritized. We also want the guidelines to prioritize water resource development projects that protect quality, water quantity, and federal interests, especially where failure to proceed is likely to cause irreversible environmental damage, create local health threats, and jeopardize the economy. We support guidelines that consider the financial and technical ability of the local sponsor to undertake construction and particularly focus on the ability of the local sponsor to reduce overall project costs. We request the Corps address how reimbursements will be dealt with in the budget explicitly um, once the projects are ultimately authorized and can be appropriated through the federal process. For the purposes of balancing cost share needs, it's currently unclear if the reimbursements will go toward the federal or non-federal side of the cost share ledger, and we ask that that be um, clarified. Uh, we also know that there have in the past been concerns uh, precluding a non-federal sponsor from undertaking construction, and we want to ensure that um, there's no opposition um, and no you know, conflicts that because of the Army Corps requirements um, for oversight that would preclude non-federal sponsors from going forward. And we'd just like to make absolutely clear um, that this language was intended to um, move ahead projects before they are subject to congressional authorization and just found the language a little bit vague and wanted some clarity on that item for this section. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, next, Eddie. Sure, thank you. Uh, before I proceed to do that, just a quick reminder to our participants. We've had some who have joined after we delivered the announcements. If you would like to make a comment, you may dial star 1 on your phone or use the raise hand icon and you will be notified once your line is unmuted. Again, that's star 1 on your phone or use the raise hand icon on your screen. This is Sharon Balfour with Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development. I would like to comment on Section 1014, specifically when it refers to Section 203 studies. Uh, we are glad to see this in the Word of Bill. Uh, clarification is definitely needed. We are in the process now of doing a 203 study, and the should I say the uh, agreement among the core is not there. Everyone seems to think there's a different process that needs to be followed, and we are going back and forth between headquarters, division, district, 
and it's taking an inordinate amount of time, so clarification definitely is needed. And we need an MOU for the core that needs to be agreed upon within the uh, process because the core requires uh, the use of their proprietary software. And uh, they also can help with the coordination with the other agencies. And the reviews need to be clarified as well. Uh, we need an ATR review. We need independent review. We need legal review. And then we need public review. But there is still question within the core at right now as to whether all those reviews are really needed. So clarification on Section 203 studies is welcomed, and I sincerely hope you get to it quickly and inform all your employees about the process and what is actually needed. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, next, Eddie. This is Jim Stark, Executive Director, Gulf Intracoastal Canal Association. I am commenting on Title II, Navigation, Section 2008, Assessment of Operation and Maintenance Needs of the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway and the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. The Gulf Intracoastal Canal Association strongly recommends the Corps of Army Corps of Engineers solicit and carefully consider the inputs of intracoastal waterways stakeholders regarding intracoastal waterways operations and maintenance priorities and processes as it develops its required report in accordance with Section 2008. Increased traffic and usage of the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway, especially in Texas and Louisiana, makes appropriate O&M funding levels and prudent use of those funds critically important to ensuring the flow of commerce continues safely and efficiently in this region. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Eddie, next. Hello. My name is Tom Mueller and I'm with the Illinois Corn Growers Association. And uh, I would like to say that uh, I, I thank you for allowing me to comment today and that uh, we are in favor of the concept of uh, public-private partnership with uh, economic analysis and how this would work with uh, shipping as needed. Uh, but uh, we think this is uh, something that uh, could be very beneficial and we're uh, opposed to any lockage fees. I also, uh, the corn growers support the uh, six to nine cent increase in the current barge diesel fuel fee. And uh, we realize that this uh, fee would probably be passed on to uh, the farmers and the shippers. But uh, we have done some studies to show that uh, uh, this would probably only cost us two tenths of a cent per bushel, uh, and uh, right now the the uh, cost in waiting time uh, because of delays on the river uh, amounts to about two cents a bushel. So we would like the Corps of Engineers and the administration to uh, support the enactment of this user fee. Thank you for letting me comment. All right, and thank you for those comments. Uh, Eddie, next. Jim, you may go ahead. Hi, this is Jim Walker with the American Association of Port Authorities. Um, so we want to, like all the others, commend the Corps of Engineers for conducting these listening sessions and soliciting comments before developing your implementation guidance. AATA represents the leading port authorities in the Western Hemisphere and on behalf of our U.S. members, we offer the following recommendations. For Title II, Section 2102, this section uh, establishes a new O&M funds distribution approach to address increased harbor maintenance tax funding for expanded uses at donor ports, emerging harbors, underserved, and Great Lakes ports. 
Word implementation guidance needs to clearly state that the Section 2102 process will be used whenever O&M funds exceed the baseline fiscal year 2012 appropriation, which is $898 million. In subparagraph A, uh, expanded uses, this establishes the use of funds for birth dredging and removal of legacy contaminated sediment. The implementation guidance should address the role of the non-federal project sponsor. Uh, the non-federal project sponsor should be the point of contact for discussions with the core district on expanded use work, such as scope, budget estimate, and priority. Um, they should work with the, uh, between the port and the local core district uh, that leads, leads to be sought and provided on an annual basis. Um, and the core needs to be uh, working with the non-federal sponsors in accomplishing this expanded use work and determining how much, whether this is to be done by the core or by the sponsor. Uh, implementation guidance should also establish a nationally consistent format to submit this information. Under Section 2106, Additional Measures at Donor Ports and Energy Transfer Ports, uh, Section 2106 authorizes appropriating up to $50 million for distribution to qualifying ports. However, the appropriations bill is not written in the same manner as WERDA and instead provides the programmatic funding in addition to project-specific funding. The Corps' implementation guidance should establish that Section 2106 work should only be pursued when funds are specifically appropriated for this purpose by Congress. Again, the implementation guidance should address the role of a non-federal project sponsor. We feel that non-federal project sponsors should provide their distribution decision to the core district on an annual basis. Uh, AAPA respectfully requests that the core meet with the donor and energy transfer ports to discuss the funding distribution processes uh, since the legislation is unclear and to pursue this at your earliest convenience. Uh, also, the implementation guidance should uh, highlight an interim measure that the core work with Customs and Border Protection to establish the process for payments to the importers and shippers that's possible under this section. We have 30 seconds. All right. We also have comments on Section 1014 in the uh, studies. Uh, we're looking at the new section, is, is Section 203, to eliminate the restrictions that non-federal port sponsors conduct feasibility studies on their own, uh, signaling Congress's clear intent that the Corps be able to uh, provide technical assistance. And the implementation guidance should clearly establish the sponsor's authority to request economic and environmental analysis and have this work performed by the Corps on a cost reimbursable basis. I think we'll leave it at that and uh, pursue, we'll be providing our uh, additional comments uh, in writing. Um, so, Gene, uh, say we've, we've got a second, second's all you need, so thanks so much. <laughs> Uh, yeah, roll tide, Jim. Uh, we'll go back to, uh, and if you want to uh, queue up again, uh, you can uh, come back into the line. And uh, Eddie, next. This is Steve Fitzgerald, Chief Engineer with Harris County Flood Control District. Also, I have two other hats on with NASMA and the National Waterways Conference today. And I'd like to uh, make a couple of suggestions or recommendations for Section 1014. Uh, first one is that it's uh, difficult for local sponsors to take the lead for construction projects because it requires the local sponsor to complete the project in its entirety prior to requesting the federal share reimbursement. Uh, so what, because of that, we're asking that you include an opportunity for local sponsors to be eligible for periodic reimbursements as defined in policy guidance lender number 53 for the federal share. Uh, dependable periodic federal reimbursements are really critical for the success and timely implementation of primarily large projects. And local sponsors, we rely on the federal reimbursements in order to let the next construction contract to keep the project going. So we recommend that uh, you include that in the, in the guidance. We also uh, request that you allow local sponsors uh, to be eligible for reimbursement for the federal share of work if that work is later recommended by the Chief of Engineers and approved by the Secretary of the Army. 
This allows a sponsor to begin implementing work on the projects at our risk prior to the study being approved and federal appropriations. And this is particularly important in urban areas uh, like Harris County and Houston, where implementation opportunities can quickly change and the need to be ready for the next flood event is absolutely imperative. Uh, I guess I'm going to add a third one. Uh, just the uh, third one is, it mentions under the construction portion of 1014 uh, about the necessity of getting any permit or approval that's required uh, and also to ensure compliance with environmental laws. Uh, and Jan, I know you're, we've been talking about this a long time, but try to make it pretty clear in this guidance about uh, try, not, try not to duplicate efforts by the core and local sponsors when you go through the full NEPA planning process and um, then have to go turn around and get a Section 44 permit uh, for your project. Uh, so I think this would be a good opportunity to clear, clarify that for future local sponsors that take the lead on these construction projects. And uh, that's all I have. I'd just like to thank the Corps and Gene and Jan for conducting these listening sessions. They've been successful. And we appreciate it. All right, Steve, thank you for those comments. And uh, next, Eddie. Caller, your line might be, uh, you may have muted your phone on your end, even though your line is unmuted through the system. Please take a look at your mute button and try that one more time. I did do that, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Kirsten Nicholson. I work with the Upper Mississippi River Basin Association, which is a regional interstate organization representing the states of Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri, and Wisconsin. And first, I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide input into a word of implementation guidance. Uh, regarding non-federal implementation provision, Section 1014, our states and partner non-governmental organizations are experiencing significant hurdles to signing partnership for that are preventing important water resource projects from advancing. This is mostly due to the fact that agreements are becoming very restrictive legally. For example, non-federal sponsors are now required to maintain project the projects in per perpetuity rather than the life of the project. In addition, the agreements indemn indemnify the project sponsor, making them liable for unanticipated costs, including the cost for damages resulting from design flaws by the Corps and its contractor. These issues will likely uh, prohibit non-federal sponsors from advancing construction of water resource projects until they are addressed. Uh, regarding Section 1043, uh, we believe that WERDA provides tremendous potential for improving infrastructure through a P3. However, there's re relatively little knowledge of how a P3 would work on a waterway, especially on a lock and dam system that runs along state borders. We believe that a robust, thoughtful dialogue is needed to move from conceptual ideas of how a P3 might work to a more detailed application. We would encourage that these discussions involve all direct stakeholders, including industry shippers and operators in the states. Um, we would, um, there are several questions that need to be considered. Um, and we would a caution against uh, using P3s to supplant federal funding and instead to use them to supplement federal investment on the waterways and increase overall infrastructure spending. Um, some questions would include um, um, how would a P3 be funded? Would there be a, a need for a governance model, a financing authority? Who would be in charge? What would be the geographic scope? Um, how would that be governed? What would be the funding revenue mechanism? How would that be structured and who would pay? What would, would that revenue be sufficient and predictable enough to attract investment? Who would be the private investor? What risk would a private investor have to assume? What risk would the states and localities have to assume? Would the reliability of the navigation system be ensured to provide reasonable risk? What might be the process and form to explore these and other implementation questions that are needed? Um, especially if this project is systemic in nature and has a larger geographic scope. Uh, regarding Title II, subsection A on navigation. We have 30 seconds. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, we are, were um, uh, encouraged to see that the conference committee had uh, specifically acknowledged the Upper Mississippi um, in its conference committee report um, that the system is a nationally significant ecosystem and navigationally significant or na 
commercial navigation system and declare their ongoing commitment to the navigation ecosystem sustainability project. There are important small scale navigation uh, projects ready to construct and large scale projects um, that would address our critical capacity constraints in the upper mist. Um, these infrastructure improvements will allow the region to capitalize on the Panama Canal expansion, which will make international commerce even faster and less expensive. And the states, the governors have recently sent a letter to President Obama uh, seeking the administration's support uh, and providing funding in FY16 specifically for NASP. Thank you. All right, thank you. Eddie, next. Brady, please go ahead. Hello, my, my name is Grady Bryant with the Hagen and Bryant Associates. I'd like to address concerns with regarding Section 1014 and 1043. Primarily, that's any implementation guidance look to improve the system, remove du duplicative efforts, specifically referencing uh, USC Section 408 and the recent guidance provided by the Corps and its impact and involve it in 1014 and 1043 projects. This is viewed as duplicative, costly to the sponsor, and um, needs to be addressed carefully to provide the efficiency intended by Congress. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you for those comments. Uh, next, Eddie. This is Gary Niemeyer with the National Foreign Growers Association. This is in reference to 2006. Um, in Section 2006, further provides for an immediate start of NIST. In the section on WERDA, a, a new cost sharing formula is established for fiscal 2015 and beyond to complete uh, Olmstead lock and dam projects. The intended effect of the provision is to free up funds in the Inland Waterway Trust Fund so that those funds can be uh, appropriated uh, for the construction and other priorities of the Inland Waterway projects, mainly an immediate start of Lot 25 and the Grange shortly thereafter. Um, NCGA is the current list of priority projects under the capital development plan, and none of these should be deauthorized. Navigation is the largest and a fundamental mission of the Corps. Its priority should not be forgotten or overshadowed by other core mission areas. NCGA is supportive of the concept of the public-private partnership, P3S, but economic analysis of how this would work for large shipping is needed. The, the uh, industry, uh, along with members of Congress, remain strongly opposed to walkage fees in any form. NCGA also proposes shareholders support six to nine cent increase in the current barge diesel fuel uh, user fee is needed to generate additional revenue for the construction of Inland Waterway Custom Modernization Projects to occur. The Corps of Engineers Administration should support the, in, uh, the enactment this year for these proposals. I want to thank the Corps for the opportunity to uh, make comments. All right. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Eddie, next. Bradley, you may go ahead. Thank you very much. This is Bradley Watson with the Coastal States Organization. Uh, this, these comments will be applicable to Section 1014 uh, and others generally. Uh, the Coastal States Organization appreciates the opportunity to contribute to today's word of listening session and applauds the Army Corps of Engineers for reaching out to the states and fostering cooperation through this process. Overall, CSO would encourage the Corps to maintain the constructive nature promoted by these listening sessions beyond today and to continue a robust dialogue with the coastal states as WERDA is implemented on paper and on the ground. 
Uh, given the expertise of State Coastal Zone managers and other relevant uh, state entities, as well as a history of cooperation with Army Corps and Coastal Civil Wars projects, the Coastal States' input and perspective will prove valuable in, in the continuing dialogue on implementation of numerous word of provisions. For instance, uh, Coastal States can provide significant contributions and perspective on the detailed implementation of today's discussion topic of non-federal implementation, as well as previous topics addressed during these listening sessions, including uh, deauthorizations and backlog prevention, uh, Section 701 Annual Report to, Cong uh, to Congress, regulatory efforts, port and harbor maintenance, uh, and host of other word of provisions not addressed during the listening sessions. Uh, additionally, we applaud the Corps Institute for Water Resources for continuing to advise, advise the states, uh, pursue innovation, and lead discussions with partners about alternative ways to get funding when Congress does not provide enough. We also applied the Corps, uh, Army Corps Civil Works for their forward-thinking efforts to devise better approaches to coastal resilience and flood risk reduction uh, and work on establishing measure or indices for resilience. Uh, as recent history has shown, our coastal communities are particularly susceptible to extreme weather events and other water resource vulnerabilities. Coastal states are also home to a disproportionately large amount of population uh, and contribute a significant share to the national economy. Moving forward, the coastal states are eager to provide valuable input regarding the implementation of WERDA as it relates to coastal civil works projects and look forward to constructively, uh, working constructively and in cooperation with the Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you very much. Bradley, thanks for, the, thanks for those remarks. Uh, Eddie, next. Hi, my name is Greg Reed. I'm from the LA Department of Water and Power. And I'd like to say thank you for um, providing the opportunity to provide comment on the uh, water implementation guidelines. And LADWP looks forward to having an interactive dialogue with the Army Corps as to how uh, the Army Corps will respond to everyone's comments provided through these venues. Um, I'm providing comment on the Section 1014 and would like to start with um, recommending that the Army Corps consider having a document, a preliminary environmental analysis document, which would allow for uh, an early determination as to the eligibility of a non-federal sponsor's project, um, the eligibility for authorization. And this uh, initial document uh, would allow for uh, identifying the constraints, the risks and the environmental issues that need to be addressed within the feasibility study, but it would stop short of requiring a full NEPA compliance during that period. Um, we would also recommend that the Army Corps consider using um, a non-federal environmental review process, such as in our case, uh, the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, as a basis for preparing the NEPA documents that would be in support of the non-federal interest project. Uh, and then that would be followed by uh, the federal agency issuing a FONSI, uh, which could save significant time at the federal level as the process would not require uh, duplicative work uh, for the environmental review. We also recommend that um, the Army Corps develop a process for formulating these feasibility studies that would be undertaken completely by the non-federal sponsor in such a way that it's a streamlined and user-friendly process with requirements that are set appropriately for the types of projects that are being undertaken. Uh, we also urge the Army Corps to issue the guidance uh, for the feasibility studies as soon as practical so that way we can act expeditiously towards the development of our projects uh, without spending resources and efforts that may not be necessary to comply with the um, 1014 guidelines. It certainly should be anticipated by the Army Corps that many federal sponsors will seek to um, pursue their projects with limited involvement by the federal agencies. In particular, the involvement may be in the area of identifying project eligibility, reviewing feasibility studies, providing recommendations to Congress, administering financial assistance, and assuring compliance under the WARDA guidelines. So there should be flexibility in the guidance to provide for the appropriate level of federal involvement uh, when requested by the non-federal sponsor. Let's see, we also would recommend that the process for... You have 30 um, seconds. Okay, thank you. Uh, the process for non-federal sponsors who seek to pursue their construction of their projects um, be clearly identified so that way 
the non-federal sponsors can uh, assure that they can complete the project and, and gain the reimbursement and financial assistance that is provided under WARDA. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, next caller, Eddie. Uh, this is Spencer Murphy with yeah. This is Spencer Murphy with Canal Barge Company in New Orleans. Um, uh, Canal Barge Company is a member of both uh, Gulf and our Coastal uh, Canal Association and Waterways Council Inc. So we we endorse those comments, but I will not repeat them here. Um, I wanted to make a comment on specifically on Section 2013, Operation and Maintenance of Fuel Tax Inland Waterways. And specifically, I uh, would like to comment on its applicability to the uh, IHNC floodgate project each, east of New Orleans. Um, as I read the language in the WARDA uh, law, it says that notwithstanding any other provision of the law, the secretary shall be responsible for the O&M, uh, including repair of any floodgate, as well as any pumping station constructed within the channel as a single unit with that floodgate. Um, we have heard some um, comments from the local district that until they are given more clear instructions or given specifically authorized funds to carry out that mission that they can't do so, meaning that the local state and flood protection authorities are still the ones manning this critical navigational lock structure. Uh, the very clear intent of the law and the very clear reading of the law says that the Corps should take over the uh, actual functioning and operation of those gates uh, ASAP. Uh, and we would encourage the Corps headquarters to please make sure that is made clear to the district uh, and the division so that um, as we close out hurricane season, uh, the right people uh, are on those uh, gates operating them, which uh, by, all, uh, by all parties agree that should be the Corps of Engineers. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment, and uh, we appreciate the, uh, the willingness of the Corps to have these listening sessions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, next caller, ready? Shane, you may go ahead. Hi, my name is Shane Kenny, and I'm representing the Missouri Corn Growers Association. Uh, navigation remains a top priority uh, with regards to river management for corn growers in the state of Missouri. Section 4002 recognizes that systems that make up the Mississippi River Basin are interconnected and as well as they need to do a better job managing the basin during drought and flood conditions that threaten navigation. With that in mind, the option of releasing water from the Missouri River Reservoir should be employed during emergency drought situations to assist in maintaining navigation along the Mississippi River. In addition, continued focus and investments should be made on the lower Missouri River to maintain a reliable navigation channel. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Shane. Uh, next, Eddie. Martin, you may go ahead. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, for public input on impl implementation of WERDA. My name is Marty Heddle. I'm the current chairman of the Inland Waterway User Board. I'm going to speak to the navigation uh, section, specifically 2002 project delivery process re and reforms, 2004 Inland Waterway Revenue Studies, 2005 Inland Waterway Stakeholder Roundtable. In each, each section, there are several references that the Secretary of the Army, at a minimum, shall consult with representatives of the Inland Waterway User Board, board in coordination with the Inland Waterway User Board and in consultation with the Inland Waterway User Board. The Inland Waterway User Board being the navigation industry's primary contact with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on new construction and major rehab projects, along with the navigation industry being the only entity that contributes monies into the Inland Waterway Trust Fund, the Board believes it's vital that the Inland Waterway User Board be involved with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Secretary's Office as prescribed in the Word of 2014 legislation in Sections 2002, 2004, and 2005. Specifically in Section 2002, Subsection D, Capital Investment Pro Program, requires the Secretary of the Army to develop in coordination with the Inland Waterway User Board a new 20-year capital investment program for the inland and intercoastal waterways taking into consideration the IMTS capital project's business model and ensuring that investments are made efficiently and in a geographically dispersed manner. 
The board believes that the navigation industry as cost-sharing partners for this 20-year plan should be given full opportunity to participate in the development of the 20-year plan. Also under Section 2002 under administration, administration, Paragraph 2, members are not considered special government employees. The law states for purposes of complying with the Federal Advisory Committee Act, the members of the user board shall not be considered special government employees as defined in Section 202 of Title 18 of the United States Code. The board believes this will prevent a lapse in board conducting its business as we experienced in 2011 and briefly in 2013. In Section 2006, Preserving the Illinois Waterway Trust Fund, Paragraph 3, Sense of Congress, appropriations for Olmstead should not be less than $150 million for each fiscal year until the construction of the project is completed. And in Paragraph 4, Rehabilitation pro uh, Projects. Section 205 of the Water Resources Development Act of 1992, 33 U.S. States Code, Section 2327, amended by striking $8 million and inserting $20 million. The board believes both of these paragraphs will allow construction and major rehabilitation to move forward on projects that have been languishing and in dire need of re recapitalization. Finally, under Section 6001, deauthorization of in inactive products, the Inland Waterway Use Board believes that no project on the current list of priority projects contained in Inland Marine Transportation Systems Capital Projects Business Model, final report dated April 13, 2010, should be included for deauthorization. That will conclude my statement. I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity for public input into the implementation of the Water Resources Reform and Development Act of 2014. Marty, thank you. Okay, Eddie, next. This is Sherry Felder with Channel Shipyard. I'm also a board member of Waterways Council and of the Gulf and Coastal Canal Association. And I would just like to reiterate Mr. Tui's comment regarding the Bayasaro Lock. This lock is a critical link in the waterway system and fast becoming one of the weakest links connecting the Gulf and Coastal Waterway and the Lower Mississippi River. Reconsideration should be given to the economic justification of Biosaur Lot for priority construction funding in the 20-year de capital development plan in view of the steadily increasing volumes of petroleum-related cargo moving on the Port Allen route. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. All right, Sherry, thank you. Uh, next, Eddie. Scott, you may go ahead. Thank you. This is Scott Sigmund, Transport and Export Infrastructure Lead for the Illinois Soybean Association. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to offer some comments on the implementing guidance uh, for the Army Corps of Engineers. There are several pieces of uh, pilot programs uh, across the uh, uh, word of language and uh, uh, sections. Uh, today we are focused on 1043. Uh, the non-federal interests, but uh, it was earlier mentioned that there are also public-private partnership pilot programs. Uh, under 2002, there is a pilot program for improving efficiency of project delivery. Uh, there may be a project that incorporates several of the pilot programs, and in the interest of efficiency and future project delivery, uh, in the interest of efficiency of finance and uh, working through public-private partnerships, uh, some coincident uh, and collaborative or uh, singularly focused reporting uh, work with the core and not the uh, tripartite approach that uh, might incorporate all three of those types of pilot programs uh, should be considered when uh, uh, working through the implementing guidance for the marketplace. Thank you for your uh, attention, and that concludes my comment. All right. Thank you, Scott. Next, Eddie. Carly, please go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Carly Brown, and I am a water policy advisor for the Western Governors Association. WGA represents the governors of 19 western states and three U.S. flag islands. The association is an instrument of the governors for bipartisan policy development, information exchange, and collective action on issues of critical importance to the western United States. 
In multiple letters over the course of con congressional consideration of WERDA, the Western Governors Association asked Congress to reauthorize WERDA with continued recognition and protection of state authority, interest, and rights in water management. This state authority over water management includes surplus water stored at U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Reclamation Reservoirs. WGA supports Section 1046, Reservoir Operations and Water Supply, which prohibits the Secretary of the Army from charging a fee for surplus water storage over the next 10 years on Corps of Engineers reservoir projects in the Upper Missouri River Basin. Moreover, WGA urges the Corps to consider our August 21, 2013 letter to Assistant Secretary for Civil Works, Joellen Darcy, on the issue of surplus water. In that letter, WGA Executive Director James Augsbury asked for substantive state consultation on the development of a rule regarding policies by which the Corps will determine prices for, for surplus water contracts. The Western Governors also highlight the need to in invest in water infrastructure in their policy resolution 14-3, Water Resource Management in the West. WGA urges the Corps to consider the vital role for in infrastructure improvements to help states manage water resources and cope with drought. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carly. Uh, next, Eddie. Hi, this is Greg Reed from LA Department of Water and Power. Wanted to add one more item to my comments earlier regarding Section 1014. Uh, Section 1014 indicates that a final feasibility study for water resources development and conservation and other purposes that is specifically authorized by Congress to be carried out um, by the Secretary could result from a project feasibility study. And so I wanted to um, suggest uh, or recommend that as Army Corps develops the uh, implementation guidance that that process for determining other project purposes be included in the guidance, specifically having a process for identifying congressional support and providing priority for such projects. So this would include the process of working with the secretary to develop the appropriate documentation to request congressional authorization to direct the secretary to carry out such projects for uh, other purposes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Greg. Next, Eddie. Ryan, please go ahead. This is Ryan McFarland from the Port of Seattle. And Port of Tacoma shares our views, and they have asked me to speak for them today as well. Our comments will address Title II, Subtitle B, Sections 2102 and 2106. First, Section 2106. We recommend that the Corps prioritize the rulemaking process for this section and not delay until Congress appropriates funding. The legislation leaves a lot of unknowns that need to be explored. And since an appropriation is, like, is likely to occur late in the budget process, there won't be much time to address these issues and implement a whole program. The Corps should consult donor ports as it develops the regulations for the donor port provisions. Ports can contribute to making sure the policy is workable. For the rebate program, the Corps should investigate whether Customs and Border Protection collects the information it needs to carry it out. It's our understanding they do have the necessary information from Customs forms, but the Corps should ver verify that and determine whether additional data needs to be gathered. The rebate program should focus on discretionary cargo in order to mitigate diversion of U.S. cargo to non-U.S. ports. That, uh, the purpose of the rebate provision is to mitigate cargo diversion. And that's only an issue with discretionary cargo. We aren't quite sure what the details of such a program would look like, admittedly, but we think the Corps should begin working with CBP now and consult with donor ports to develop a methodology. For expanded uses, sections 2102 and 2106, here we also recommend the Corps consult ports when drafting implementation guidance. Seattle and Tacoma concur with the comments from Jim Walker at American Association of Port Authorities about non-federal project sponsors. And finally, we believe the Corps should approve berth dredging projects based on permitted depths rather than authorized channel depth. Ports sometimes have berth depths that are deeper than the authorized depth of federal channels in order to accommodate tidal variations during the full period of loading and unloading vessels. And if a port has obtained the necessary permits to dredge a berth deeper than the channel, 
maintenance dredging to that depth should be eligible for expanded uses funding. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. And Ryan, thank you for your comments. Uh, next caller, Eddie. Gretchen, please go ahead. Good afternoon. This is Gretchen Benjamin with the Nature Conservancy's Great National, excuse me, North American Freshwater Program. I will be commenting on Title II, Section 2004, the review of the Inland Waterways Revenue Studies, and Section 2005, the Inland Waterways Stakeholders Roundtable both provide the opportunity for representatives of the Inland Waterways User Board and representatives of other non-navigation beneficiaries to work towards balanced system uses on our rivers and waterways. At the Nature Conservancy, we consider these provisions a positive approach to continue playing a constructive role to ba balance navigation uses with other river uses, especially ecosystem restoration. We will actively participate if given the chance to be a part of these processes. In Section 2101 of WERDA, ramped up funding for the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund begins immediately and moves to full funding by 2025. Also noted in Section 2102 is the acknowledgement of the Panama Canal expansion and larger ship sizes will require some U.S. ports and harbors to deepen drafts. We can expect increased dredging and disposal as a result of both of these provisions. It is imperative that guidance documents promote opportunities for beneficial use of dredge material for three reasons. First, site capacity can be renewed with beneficial use of dredge material and minimize the need for additional site development and environmental impact associated with site development. Second. The beneficial use of dredge material can be used to restore barrier islands, floodplain islands, and other ecosystem attributes that have been lost to activities associated with the construction and operation and maintenance of the navigation system. And third, beneficial use of dredge material in support of ecosystem restoration can reduce costs for both dredging and ecosystem restoration efforts. Guidance should clearly articulate district responsibilities for coordination across dredging and ecosystem restoration projects and emphasize that when material is suitable for environmental benefit, it should be the first consideration in an effort to minimize some of the additional impacts associated with increased port and harbor depth. Thank you for this opportunity. Okay. Gretchen, thank you. Uh, next, Eddie. David, please go ahead. This is David Peterson with the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority of Louisiana. Uh, these comments are with regard to Section 2013 and requesting that the Corps, as part of their guidance, they engage uh, CPRA and other local entities with regard to implementation of that provision. The provision specifically says that the Corps shall be responsible for their operation and maintenance of the particular flood control gates and associated pump stations in, in that section. At this point in time, the Corps has not yet engaged or had discussions with the local entities with regard to the provisions and sections of various flood control projects in Louisiana in which that section is applicable and we believe that the Corps should be engaging those entities because the statute requires them to take those over and would require them to have taken them over in June, and they have not engaged anyone in terms of doing that because at this point in time, the local entities are responsible and doing operation and maintenance of those structures at their own cost. Thank you. David, thank you. Next, Eddie. Yes, hi, this is Andy Warner with the Nature Conservancy. I'd like to make some comments on Section 1046, Reservoir Operations and Water Supply. Uh, first, guidance should clarify that in addition to specific project authorizations, the definition of authorized purposes includes the agency's universal authority 
and responsibilities under laws that apply generally to all core reservoirs to include the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act of 1958, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act and Amendments of 1972, and the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Similarly, guidance should clarify that the definition of improving efficiency and effectiveness includes full consideration of the agency's universal authority and responsibilities under laws that apply generally to all core reservoirs to include those mentioned previously. Um, guidance also should reference specific related internal core policies such as engineering regulation 1110-2-8154 titled Water Quality and Environmental Management of Core Civil Works Projects. Uh, further, the language is sufficiently broad in 1046 to allow for the identification of opportunities to improve alignment between future operational reviews and the activities of other reservoir related programs such as the dam safety program. Uh, for example, under some circumstances, dam rehabilitations implemented through the dam safety program afford an opportunity to simultaneously increase operational facility that can subsequently improve the efficiency and effectiveness in achieving the spectrum of authorized project purposes. Uh, the language is sufficiently broad to allow the assessment carried out under Section 1046 to identify projects that are no longer serving the congressionally authorized purposes. Uh, guidance should clarify that such projects are to be identified as part of the assessment. And finally, uh, the guidance also, sh also should clarify that language related to funding from other sources is intended to enable contributions from non-federal entities in support of sec uh, Section 1046 goals, but in no way requires such contributions or otherwise removes agency uh, authority, legal responsibilities uh, to allocate necessary resources for restoring and maintaining environmental quality around agency projects through, as necessary, modification of projects and project operations. Thank you very much. Andy, thank you. Um, Eddie, next. Let me take a look here. First, a quick reminder to all of our participants, if you would like to make a comment, you may dial star 1 on your phone or use the raise hand icon on your screen. You'll be notified once your line is unmuted. Your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Hi, this is Paul Rohde representing the members of the Waterways Council calling from St. Louis, Missouri. I want to comment on a few things uh, in WERDA. First of all, as was mentioned, subsection D, uh, section of 2002, uh, requires the creation of a new 20-year capital development plan, taking into consideration the Inland Marine Transportation System Capital Projects business model from 2010. That plan was the product of a public-private cooperation between the Corps and the Inland Waterways Users Board. The plan calls for an immediate start for the Navigation Ecosystem Sustainability Program, or NESP, with lock construction on the Mississippi River getting an immediate start and on the Illinois Waterway shortly thereafter. As the cost-sharing community for lock and dam projects, navigation stakeholders should be given full opportunity to participate in the development of any new plan and also all due consideration should be taken into account for the capital development plan of 2010 that was already assembled. Section 2006 further provides for an immediate NESP start establishing as has been mentioned a new cost share formula to complete the Olmstead Dam project with the intention to free up Inland Waterways Trust Fund dollars so those funds can be appropriated for the construction of other priority inland waterway projects, such as those that was in the capital development plan I just mentioned. Also, Section 4002, the Joint Explanatory Statement of the Committee of Conference, directs the Corps to an immediate start for NESP, stating that the Upper Mississippi River System is the only river designated by the United States Congress as a nationally significant ecosystem and a nationally significant commercial navigation system and references that Congress declared its commitment to modernize the lock and dam infrastructure and also improve its ecosystem with NESP authorization in word of 2007. The governors of the five upper basin states, as was mentioned, sent a letter on August 20th to the president requesting an immediate start to NESP. 
and this could occur with FY15 discretionary funds and continue with the FY16 budget. Finally, Section 2010, uh, the core, as we have already com commented, should produce an analysis of the impact to the Upper St. Anthony Falls lot closure and using WERDA 2007 as precedent should address and include recommendations for compensation for shippers and carriers adversely impacted by the closure. And that closure should not occur prior to June 9th of 2015. Thank you. All right. Paul, thank you. Uh, Eddie, next. Cheryl, please go ahead. Did you say Cheryl? Yes, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Cheryl Johnson. I'm Grants Administrator and Project Development Specialist for the Union County, Arkansas Water Conservation Board. I'm speaking really to a combination of all three word of focus areas, more specifically a water supply from our non-federal constructed project has allowed for dramatic groundwater recovery. However, our non-federal project is dependent on a core project authorized for navigation, but not water supply. Our county is contiguous to North Louisiana parishes, so this statement represents stakeholders from both states, five South Arkansas counties, and three North Louisiana parishes. Our non-federal Washtenaw River Alternative Industrial Water Supply Project is a $65 million industrial water supply project constructed by 88% local, 8% state, and 4% federal funds and completed in 2004. The Washtenaw River Alternative Industrial Surface Water is drawn from the abundant Washtenaw River water supply behind Thatcher Lock and Dam. Thatcher is the uppermost of four locks and dams on the Corps of Engineers Washita Black River Navigation Project. We are, as you know, in the Vicksburg District. Thatcher began operating recently on a dramatically reduced schedule due to minimal barge traffic. Our water supply project was constructed to provide an alternative industrial source to our rapidly depleting and critically threatened Sparta Aquifer groundwater. Prior to 2004, the Sparta Aquifer was Union County's only source of drinking and industrial water. In the fall of 2004, Union County began delivering Washita River surface water to local industries, an oil refinery, a brominated products manufacturer, and a nitrogen fertilizer plant originally built as a World War II ordnance plant. All three previously relied solely on the Sparta. A 2205-megawatt natural gas-fired merchant power plant also relies on this surface water supply. The nitrogen fertilizer plant is currently undergoing a major expansion that will create an additional 150 to 200 jobs and could not be done without the Washita River water supply. Since 2004, and as a direct result of using the alternative water source from the Washita River, groundwater levels have risen dramatically in Union and surrounding counties and parishes. One well has risen over 76 feet since October 2004. Prior to 2004, wells in and around Union County were declining dramatically, some as much as seven feet per year. Although the Washita Black is authorized for navigation, we are asking that forthcoming policy changes will provide a clear path for project modifications, including the authorization of other important purposes, such as water supply. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, Eddie, next. And Dean, at this time, I do not believe we have any further comments in the queue. Well, uh, we'll, we'll hold here for about another minute or so to see if anybody uh, comes on and raises their hand again. And I would like to remind our participants that if you would like to raise your hand and make a comment, you may dial star 1 on your phone or use the raise hand icon on your screen. You will be notified once your line is on mute. Christine, you may go ahead. Yes, thank you. My name is Christine Compton. I'm with the Irvine Ranch Water District here in Southern California. Like some of the other callers, we wanted to um, provide comments to you today on Section 1014 of WERDA. Um, specifically, we would love to see the process for formalizing the guidelines for this section um, you know, moved forward and moved um, put forward expeditiously. 
Um, we would love to see the Corps look at a more streamlined process so these projects can get up the ground, get off the ground, get going, and um, then the feasibility studies put forward to the Corps for your consideration. Additionally, like some of the other callers today, we want to recommend that the Army Corps consider um, looking at a preliminary environmental analysis document which would contain sufficient materials to assist the Corps in determining whether a project should be eligible for authorization, but not a full environmental um, analysis document. But it would be an initial environmental review and then the project proponent would you know, move forward with an environmental review, um, full environmental review subsequent to the feasibility study. Additionally, like other callers, we agreed that um, and hope that the Corps would consider looking at um, you know, using state environmental processes to speed up the NEPA documents and use those as the baselines. And finally, um, we look forward to continuing to work with the Corps with the hopes that we can get these guidelines streamlined and move forward quickly so projects throughout the country can move forward. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Christine. Um, Eddie, do we have anybody else? We do have a couple more. Just a quick reminder to those who are only dialed in, you'll hear an automated message telling your line has been unmuted. You may proceed to state your name, organization, and your state and your comment. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Klein Jones. I'm the executive director of the Tennessee River Valley Association. I'd like to generally address uh, Title II. Uh, the Tennessee River is, is home to two IWTF projects that have not seen funding for the past oh, three to five years. Kentucky Lot Addition was the, uh, the first IWTF project to be delayed by the insolvency in the IWTF. Uh, though we do uh, support the preservation of the IWTF, we do oppose the lockage fees and are in support of the adjustment in the six to nine cents uh, per gallon in the fuel tax for the IWTF. Uh, we encourage Current project prioritization is laid out in the capital development plan, and we oppose uh, deauthorization of any critical waterway navigation projects, also included in the, in, the, in the capital development plan. That's all we have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, move on to the next one, Eddie. Yes, it's Deborah Colbert once again with uh, Waterways Council. I have a, a new comment, but. Uh, related to navigation. I just want to note that it is important for the locks to be open on the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers, uh, especially for special events uh, in that region. And the Corps should continue to dialogue with stakeholders in that region and na nationwide uh, to ensure that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Deb. Um, next, Eddie. I don't have any further comments here on the line at this point, Gene. All right, we'll go ahead and hold for about another minute here. All right, Eddie, if uh, we advance to the, uh, the next step slide, there we go. And uh, I will turn it back over at this time to uh, Jan Raskus to make some closing comments. Again, as a reminder, the recording and transcript from today's session will be made available on the CORE's WERDA website. Also, I want to remind you that this is the last listening session that we will be, held, be holding on WERDA 2014, but we will continue to accept any written comments that you might have. 
Again, those go to WRRDA at USAC.army.nl. So thank you again for your comments today, and um, we will look forward to uh, taking those into consideration as we develop our implementation guidance.